Hello, my name is Terry Collins, and I'll be your lecturer for part of this course. I'm a professor of chemistry at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The course is entitled Introduction to Green Chemistry. We're going to start the course in a very unusual way for a chemistry class. We're going to begin by exploring sustainability ethics. Then we'll move on to focus on hazards to health and the environment, which help reveal green chemistry's most important challenges. And finally, in the latter lessons, we'll study the technical content of green chemistry research and the field's major accomplishments. The Essentials of Green Chemistry – Changing Course What are the primary goals of green chemistry? Green chemists are working to help build the technical dimension of a sustainable civilization. We work to identify, understand and replace unsustainable products and processes with those we believe, based on current science, are sustainable alternatives. And we're working to develop a field of chemistry that can replace polluting technologies one product or process at a time, as well as to develop entirely new technologies uh, that by the standards of current science appear to be sustainable. Now when we fail to develop sustainable technologies and sustainable societies, we run into serious trouble. You can see this very clearly by stepping back in time and looking at some interesting places around the world where there have been sustainability breakdowns. You'll learn from this that sustainability thinking in real time is critical to the welfare of a civilization. And so we'll start by using this wonderful program Google Earth to take you to the city of Ephesus in western Turkey. Ephesus was founded in 10 BC and was abandoned somewhere in the Middle Ages. It had a very illustrious history during its more than a thousand years of existence. However, local agrarian practices led to silting up of the Kastros River, and Ephesus was slightly inland from the sea and a port city. When the city lost its port, it lost the underpinnings of its economy, it was eventually abandoned and is there now for tourists to marvel at because it's in incredibly good condition. But when the Ephesians were building Ephesus, it's obvious that they would not have had this fate in mind for their city. So what qualifies as sustainable development? There's been a lot of discussion about that, and you can read many wonderful books and find a great deal of information on the web. One now famous definition goes back more than 20 years. According to this definition, sustainable development is the development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. This definition was produced by the Brundtland Commission and published in their report Our Common Future in 1987. It's the second part of that definition, without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs, that is so critical to much of the content of this course and to sustainability in general. This is the idea of transgenerational justice. It ain't easy being green. You might wonder why the Ephesians just didn't understand and fix their problem. But as Kermit the Frog has told us, being green is, can be difficult. We could be doing a much better job in America of identifying, understanding and replacing unsustainable products and processes. But it can be difficult, very difficult, to redirect technology towards true sustainability. Partly this is because some of the biggest barriers aren't really technical in nature. They have to do with money, power and human behaviour. That's why the development of sustainability ethics is so vital. Not only this new topic should come into chemistry classes, but also it belongs in all of the departments of our universities. As the great writer and thinker and Pittsburgh native Rachel Carson said, the human race is challenged more than ever to demonstrate mastery, not over nature, but of ourselves. So that's why this course opens with material that's not purely technical in nature. We have to face not simply the technical challenges that hazardous chemicals and processes present, but also develop a new kind of ethical awareness, sustainability ethics, that will help us be smarter about how we tackle the challenges that lie ahead. Because unless we deal with the real barriers to developing green chemistry, we will never create a truly authentic field of green chemistry. We'll look more deeply into sustainability ethics in lesson two.
but for now, let's consider green chemistry's grand technology challenges. If we're ever going to have a sustainable civilization in its technological dimension, we will have solved three great problems. We'll have safe energy. There are many points of view on what is or is not safe energy. I can only express mine. I believe that new non-polluting technologies for solar to electrical or solar to chemical energy conversions are where our good future lies. The picture in the inset shows a plant in Nevada, 350 acre footprint. It's a solar thermal tech, uh, plant. It produces the energy need for, needs for 15,000 homes. I think we need more plants like this as well as plants with related solar thermal technologies as well as photovoltaic technologies and other, other sorts of uh, solar to electrical or solar to chemical energy transformations. The second grand challenge area is in renewable feedstocks. Feedstocks for the chemical industry come in the first instance from oil, coal and natural gas. The idea here is that we're going to be getting more of these feedstocks over time from recently dead rather than fossilized plant matter. There are many impressive accomplishments in this area in just the last decade and we, are, we will no doubt see it grow rapidly. The third area concerns hazardous substances and this, this really will be the major focus of our course. In the bottom left hand corner there you see the molecule dioxin 2378 tetrachlorodibenzodioxin regarded by many people as the, among the most toxic substances that we know of. There are three simple rules, in my opinion, or three key things we must do in dealing with ha hazardous substances. We need to move the elemental composition of technology closer to biochemistry. When you produce a technology based on a toxic element like lead, cadmium or mercury, especially if the technology is to be distributive and spread uh, around through our economy, then eventually those elements will be released to the environment and they will be on the move and encounter living things and if the living things have susceptibility there will be toxicity. Much better if our technologies are made of the same ele elements that we're comprised of and that other living things are comprised of. That's a big area of work for green chemistry. We need to eliminate persistent environmentally mobile chemicals. Many of our most serious problems, the ozone hole, many of the manifestations of endocrine disruption that we'll talk so much about, have to do with persistent environmentally mobile chemicals. Now in some cases, really, the value of such a persistent environmentally mo mobile chemical is so high that most people would think we can't do without it. That's true of certain drugs, for example. When that's the case, green chemistry can help by getting better, better technologies for managing the persistent compound after it's been used. Finally, we really have to reduce and eliminate developmental disruptors. That's, this is the, again the area of endocrine disruption. Because here is the, where the good future for transgenerational justice lies. And I hope during this course to pre present you with much evidence to that, to, to that effect. So it's important to understand that when many technology uh, many sustainability challenges, we may already have promising technological solutions that not, are not getting enacted. Why and how can we do better? For starters, we can become more ethically aware. We can weigh the short-term benefits of current practices against the long-term damage many of them are doing and try to understand how to cost account this damage into our existing economic structures. If we don't, future generations will pay the price. Scientific evidence indicates that they are already going to be or are paying the price.